Well, what's going on, guys? Glad that you are here. Uh, this is Worship Team Training. I'm Brandon Dempsey, and we're going to be having a conversation about the um, <clears throat> how racism has been a pandemic, and not only has it been a pandemic <clears throat> for just this um, this short time in which we live, but <clears throat> unfortunately, it's been a pandemic. I think ever since the uh, creation of man. Uh, so we're going to jump into these topics. Let's just give a few minutes for everybody to pop in real quick. Uh, I just want to say what's up uh, to everybody, all of our followers. Thanks so much. And um, I want to get you guys plugged in. So if you would, go ahead. Friends, if you're watching, what's up? Thanks for joining us. Uh, swipe and invite. Let everybody know what's going on. Share this out right now with a friend because we're going to be having some discussion among these awesome, fine worship leaders that are here right with me. Uh, first, we're going to say hello to Ray Ray, my best friend, Raymond Turner, from years and years. Uh, he's up in the left-hand corner right here. Raymond, say what's up. What's up, everybody? All right, fantastic. And uh, let's go on to, uh, uh, let's see, tell us real quick, Raymond, where are you from and what are you about? Um, originally from uh, the OG H Town, uh, Houston, Texas. I'm a Houston peeps. Um, currently, we, we uh, live up in Fort Worth. We've been up here now for about four and a half years and um, love it. Awesome. All right. And then uh, right below, we have my man Swift. Now, Swift, Sean Johnson, has been on our podcast. If you've been longtime followers and fans of Worship Team Training Podcast, we've had Swift on for um, a few years. We go back to about 10 years together. Um, what caught my attention about Sean is I fell in love with his laugh, honestly. I mean, just the way he laughed, it just... It was. I know it sounds kind of funny, but it's it's. It, but it is interesting, right? When you meet people for the first time, you, and there's something about them that just kind of uh, uh, just jumps out at you. Right, you know, right. his his friendliness and kindness. Yeah, you know, I love it. So, Sean, uh, say what's up. Tell us about uh, where you're from and what you're about. Uh, I'm originally from Knoxville, Tennessee, but I've been reside I've been residing in Atlanta, Georgia, for over. 28 years so technically i've been here longer than i was born in tennessee uh i am now a lead volunteer at revolution church in canton georgia i also have a recording band hopes anchor uh that's the christian rock band and uh, i'm on the board of serve international that serves um that feed people in ludwar in, in kenya um also, did you, fun fact here, did you know about Blue War? It's one of the first, um, no. where they found the uh, yeah. oldest fossil in the world. Oh, there. Wow. Wow. And yeah, it's amazing. I saw the village. Wow. But anyway, so I'm, I'm all about loving on Jesus Christ and delivering the gospel to those people uh, that are unaware of that. And also... Stand, sharpening my iron with other fellow Christians that love the Lord. And I'm always open for knowledge. I never close my mind. I'm wide awake. And it's all about the finish and not the start. Wow. Love that. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right. To our, um, our bottom right here, Shalom. Say what's up. Where are you from? What are you about? Hey, guys. Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, so I've been in the states so about. <laughs> I'm gonna have to mute you, you Swift. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. Swift, I'm gonna have to mute you, man. If you don't behave yourself. <laughs> I was. Um, so I've been here for about. I think I moved here um, <laughs> in April. <laughs> Sorry, uh, April. Uh, 2014, uh, 2014, I think. Um, and um, so I've been here and I did some some work um, at a church uh, right here in Dorosan for about five years. Uh, and then as a uh, creative master director and recently uh, over the last year, we've, I, I mean, much longer than that, but the transition happened last year. Um, we felt led to just step out of 
uh, the walls, you know, uh, for, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, and just be part of the conversation on race, on justice, on fairness, on peacemaking. And uh, we didn't know what it looked like. We didn't know what we'll be talking about specifically, but we just thought God just make us uncomfortable with where we, where we were and, and, and feel like we could do more. And so I transitioned out of my, my role at uh, the church that I, I was at. And I've been, I've been doing shows, using my music to engage and have conversations. And uh, I've done some shows in Philly, some shows right here in Doylestown. And yeah, now we're at this point where, you know, it just seems like the conversation has gotten really more specific. I feel like we've, we've reached a point where we're like, okay, I think we know what we should be talking about over the next year. Currently, I'm doing a thing called uh, 30 Days of Songs of Freedom. And hmm. basically, I'm, I'm just playing songs that from way back then and, and even recent that talked about freedom as you know, I'm inspired by some of the songs that came out of the civil rights movement. I, yeah. I it blows my mind. Just the, the hope, mm. even the despair that's expressed in these songs, but the hope that comes out of all of it just blows me away. And mm. uh, I've been just sharing the songs for, and I'm going to be doing a song a day for until the end of the month. So that's kind of like my specific thing right now. Whilst I'm just like figuring out what to do next and as part of this movement and what's happening. It's, it's really exciting. It's it's painful because of what happened in the last month. Uh, on the other hand, I'm, I'm super excited for where the conversation is going. Awesome. Well, uh, guys, again, thanks so much for being on with us today and um, love your um, where you're at. Uh, heart wise and spirit, each of you guys mean something special to me. So um, let's kick this off. Um, and honestly, I just don't know where to begin because, you know, we were so inundated um, by the news. And let me just say up front to um, all of our friends watching here and at Worship Team Training, we're, we're not about uh, political. This is not a, a soapbox to uh, voice what we feel about the government or anything like that. That's not what we do here. But the reason why I'm bringing this program and these programs to you is because this is an important topic. It's it's a it not even a topic. I feel I feel like this is a part of our life that we really need to deal with, and so we need to speak into it. We need to be talking about it because I really feel that a lot of this has to do with education, rather than just sitting there and just taking a seat back. Um, so, Raymond, can you kind of get us into? Um, Maybe just defining what I mean. I know we we all have our own definitions and everything, but can you define what racism is and how has that affected you? Oh, oh man, um, yeah, this has been uh, kind of one of those things I've I've had to really. I, I think um, I, I've known uh, discrimination throughout my life. Um, I don't think I've known outright racism until I, I got married um, and then had children um, where I, I got to see the, the real impact of that firsthand. Um, my wife is Hispanic. Um, you know, her parents are from Guatemala and um, we've been married now 23 years. And, uh, and I remember our, our, pastor before we got married he asked us to come up with he asked us to do two things that were incredibly significant and he said i want you to write down a list of all the the divine circumstances that had to happen to bring you together so i could write it out and we've had to come back to that but then the other thing that was incredible he said i want you to come up with three purposes for your marriage and almost like a charter and, uh, and so we sat down and, and one of the three, and those three things were to begin for God to, to break down denominational barriers um, because she grew up assembly as God. I was ordained in the Southern Baptist. Um, the second one was to break down racial barriers. Um, obviously with me being 
flag and her being Hispanic. Um, there were some, you know, things there we wanted to see God do. And then the third was to raise a standard amongst uh, musicians, not just worship musicians, but whatever circle we were in musicians, we wanted the temperature to, to raise in terms of integrity. Hmm. And it's incredible because we've, we've been tested in all those areas. And I, I start with all of that just to put in context that, you know, we've known discrimination. You know, we have walked into a restaurant together and we've had hostesses standing there who saw us come in, made eye contact, and then turned around and walked away to where we had to end up seating ourselves. Um, I've had, uh, you know, a run in with, um, law with the law enforcement officer and which is a, which is a very poignant situation because my dad is a, has been a state trooper for 35 years. So I have a huge respect for law enforcement. Um, but I, I ran it, I had an incident and maybe we can talk about that a little bit yeah. later as we get along, get further along. But so my definition of uh, I think there are some discriminatory currents that run through all of us that, you know, there are biases, whether they're implicit um, or whether they're outright. But I think racism is where you actually have the power to bring those discriminatory things or those not just even iniquities, but they're I think they're generational sins when you have the power to bring those things into the light and, and impact someone in a way that shows your power and that you're able to do it, um, I think that's where we get into racism, where it's it's not just a, 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 a deference or a preferential treatment of a particular group, but it's a show of, of outright hatred. Mm. And you are in a position to actually voice that um, or show it. And so I've seen that towards uh, my, my, uh, my oldest son. Um, so yeah, that would be my definition is, uh, is, is it, it moves, it's beyond just a, well, I don't like this particular group or, the, or you kind of joke about some things that are stereotypical for a particular group, but it becomes, I not only like you, but I'm going to let you know and do everything in my power to either subjugate you or make sure that you understand how I feel about it. Hmm. Thanks, Raymond. Um, Swift, tell us like what what's going off in you when you're hearing Raymond talk. I'm hearing a lot of things that are relatable. I'm hearing, um, you know, one example I can give is that you can take ten black guys, African American men or women and put them in a room that never even met each other and they will have more than likely 10 out of 10 of them will have the same story just in a different time zone or time and space or whatever but definitely will have the same conversation I've, I've had that happen when I was listening to Ray Ray I was thinking about what happened to me at Denny's one time now, I remember Denny's actually got ended up getting a lawsuit against them for discrimination. Um, I didn't get any of that money, though. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was slow on the draw. But, uh, but um, it happened. And, and uh, you know, just making light of. But seriously, that happened to me and Denny's in Toronto. Uh, we had just... We were on our way uh, to the airport. We just finished this huge show in the Toronto Dome. And, uh, you know, so we just kind of left our hotel and was like going to try to grab some breakfast before we headed out uh, to our next gig. And, uh, man, we literally sat in the booth for about 45 minutes before a waitress came over. And it was like three people in the restaurant. And the other two people, we watched a white couple come in, they sit them down, um, went and gave them menus and served them and everything. And then we were sitting there like, what's going on? Then finally some of our other white counterparts came in and then they came over and we were like, 
Wait, wait a second. We've been sitting here for an hour, almost an hour, waiting on you to come. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was. We were bit, just made some crazy excuse. But anyway, that's showing right there. That example that I was talking about. He he dealt with that. I dealt with that. Totally different. Other place somewhere in the country. Well, that was in Toronto, but somewhere else where the same type of racism took place. And also, and uh, um, I, I have millions of stories that we pr- I would probably tell you that Ray Ray has dealt with and probably Shalom has dealt with. And it's amazing how, and this is what I think about when I hear systemic. It's created within the consciousness of people that buy into that. So if you're taught that and you think that's the right way to be, then, then you know, everyone immediately knows a click. It's kind of like us brothers. Like, if I saw Ray, did it, don't even know him, and we're walking in a building and it's just us, we'll do this. <laughs> it's the code. Yeah. The nod. I see you. I see you. I see you. We don't want to mm-hmm. Just in case. I see you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. See everybody laughing because they know I'm right. Yes. <laughs> I was in Africa. It was like, yeah. Yeah, um, right. yeah. I've seen you nod at me like that. <laughs> oh, I, no, it would be different for you, Brandon. Like, <laughs> I'm a friend. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh my God. So, uh, oh, man. No, we could laugh. That's right. You know, it's just it's one of those things, man, that's that's mm-hmm. unbelievable. And, you know, what I, I want to say this stuff black people here in America have really learned to overcome so many obstacles, like uh, obstacles you would not believe. That, that happened there's just like these undertones of things that always happen to us and we're just like walking in the room just trying to be normal that's why you know I heard someone say t- uh, this weekend I was talking he was like well think about this man people we, we always say the humblest things in a big movement black lives matter not more than anybody else not greater than not two, but just matter. Mm-hmm. We just want to matter. Mm-hmm. Not we're not saying all lives don't. Yeah, just matter. Mm-hmm. We just want to matter. We just mm-hmm. we already living, but we want our lives yeah. to mean yeah. something to everyone. Yeah, isn't that? I mean, we shall overcome. Mm. You know, it's always been the staple of words, no justice. It's a very different situation. Like we, we got our independence in 1980. Uh, we were a British colony, and we it's, a, it's majority black. And I grew up in a, I grew up in a, uh, they call them low red, um, low density uh, areas where they are like bigger. We, we were middle class. And so we had we had white people around us. So I had a few moments where, you know, um, of interpersonal um, like um, racism being pointed towards me, where someone says something towards me. And in those moments, there were there's usually very swift consequences. You know, um, you know, instant. If it was a school, you knew that it was going to get shut down immediately because we we were we were the majority back home in Zimbabwe, and and so the the racism I I experienced were few moments where someone would say either the N word or uh, back home with other words that they they they, they would use or use right now. Um, to insult you know our race and and usually it didn't really affect me that much because i knew the exact steps i needed to take to to report it to confront that person and have the conversation uh there's a certain uh leverage that we have by virtue of asking majority you know and 
when I moved here, it was, to be honest with you, my my assumption of 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 the states. You know, I I was up at 5 a.m. in the morning when when around the time when Obama um, when election night when Obama won the night mm-hmm. Obama won and and it was just so, such an amazing moment for me and I was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, racism is dead it's gone you know like and and that was my perspective from zimbabwe and when i moved here in 2014 i i was oblivious to racism here so i i actually had so many interactions that felt weird to me but i did not pick up that it was racism and it was around 2016 that you know you started to see killings on uh body cams uh, being, you know, posted like the footage being posted on social media or someone recording on their phone, and for me, that that just traumatized me because I was like, this is crazy. And in my mind, I was like, this is gonna cause outrage everywhere. And and I have Christian friends, uh, and the reaction I saw just blew my mind away. You know, like just people. Um, you know, someone would say, you'd see the news would say, oh, uh, one of the news outlets would be like, oh, look, this guy actually, like, look, he he did this wrong the other day. Like, oh, he, like he did drugs one time. And but now look, look, look at him. And, I, and, and to be honest, it, it just rocked my world. I could not believe that was happening. And for me, I it, it took me a while to to not adjust, but to actually be like, hey, this is what's happening here. And and then I, I took it to friends at church, having conversations and and met similar pushback, you know, and and so for me it it it, it became so all encompassing. So my view of racism um is it, it literally here it surrounds you. It's everywhere because you're you're um you know as black people, we are the minority. And so, but not just that, but the power, the, like the power in the country does not support black people and does not hold black people up and, 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 and stand with black people in facing um, racism at work, racism um, on the streets, racism at the stores, and and as I have as I have like seen different circumstances one after another, I realize I'm like wow like it's like drowning it's like you're you're drowning in it you know okay. uh, in, in Zimbabwe it's almost like you're you you have moments where you're walking you step in a puddle you're like oh you know my shoes are wet you know but here you're in it you're like like submerged in it and and I I am both. Um, horrified by the racism, the form of racism, the systemic form of racism that's in America. But I'm also highly inspired by like black people in America who grew up here. You know, you guys face this all your lives, and and the hope that you guys like. I mean, looking at the protests last week, I was like, oh my gosh, the energy that's coming out, the music that's coming yeah. out. The stories that are coming out um, are amazing. Uh, but coming back to my definition, I, I really believe that you know racism has a very different form here. It's more systemic, and when I say systemic, it I mean all forms of structure are not uh, there to treat black people equally. They don't. They're not. They don't exist to. To confront even the, the the interpersonal situations, they're not there to correct um, the, the the murders. The, you know, like I mean, I I saw murders on social media. I never thought I it's stuff that I saw in, in movies. Hmm. I never thought I'd see someone get killed and see the person shoot him a number of times uh, whilst he's tied down, and I never thought that person would go scot free. I never like that. For me, that's one of the peak things that made me go like, wow, um, 
the system itself, the, the governing, not it's not even just Democrat or Republican. Um, this, was, this goes way back, right? And it's just the system itself doesn't, that is not there for black people. And, and, and that became my understanding of, of, of racism here. So, hmm. yeah. Thanks, Shalom. Um, I, you know, this, this past weekend, I, I've learned a lot. Uh, when I was when I was younger, <clears throat> I mean, being from Houston myself, uh, along with Ray and Shalom, um, I've lived here all my life, and um, I remember at a young age, I was probably five years old, where um, I, I was in school. I remember this, and uh, my best friend was black, and I remember he cut his finger and was bleeding, and immediately when I saw the blood. It, it just, at a young age, I thought to myself immediately, wow, he bleeds just like me. There's no difference here. And, and Ray, you said something interesting last uh, Friday when we tried to do this test run. You said, you know, you can't, see, you can't say uh, that you're colorblind because you have to acknowledge the color. And you are so right about that. And for me, at a young age, I've always felt this way. My wife is Hispanic. Um, I was brought to the Lord Jesus Christ by a Hispanic family. I was discipled mm. by an African American brother, and um, and so for me, multiculturalism is something that's a part of my life, my wife's life. Uh, so I don't know any different. But when I heard the term white privilege, honestly, I just be honest, I, I've always felt it, but I never heard that phrase until just over the weekend. And I thought, mm. why is it that I've never? heard that phrase um and so i want to know from you um going back to ray um because i feel like you know we we have hardly even scratched the surface of racism um i feel like we we've done too little to, to step back and watch the oppression and just think well that's somebody else's problem uh somebody else will fix this or this will end someday and you know i it it in me, it just screams out because I, I I don't see it being an end until we actually do something about it. So, Ray, how do you feel about that? And and you know, how do you feel about the? Um, I guess what what is it? What is it going to take? Is my question. Well, let me just say you know, I've had. I've had uh, you know several friends reach out to me and, and you know they're concerned and you know I'm, I'm grateful, um, but at the same time I tell them you know I don't want you know there's there's the the dichotomy of white guilt white privilege and I've had some significant some of the most significant people who have input into my life have been white mentors and people who took the time to speak into my life. And I told them I would hate for them to, at this point, question um, the, the things that they have input into my life and, you know, subvert all of that and, and pull all the scaffolding away and go, you know, am I racist? Am I this? Uh, because I don't think that's the answer either. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a big difference too between guilt and shame. And, you know, as Christians, we, we have to deal with that and contend with that. Um, I think guilt in its rightful place and its scriptural place moves us to a place of repentance. If we let it, it moves us to a place of going, I did, yeah, this is, I did this, this was wrong, or I believe this. And now I see differently. And God's loving kindness leads us to a place of change. Uh, shame says you take that on and you identify and you go, okay, oh my goodness, this is who I am. And I think making that distinction, um, it, you know, that we can't shame people either for what they, they may not have not have known. And, uh, and just as there are, I think there are generational um, sins, we are not responsible for the sins of our ancestors. Yeah. Um, and I think the Bible makes that very clear that the, the 
you know, we're not responsible for those sins. Now, I do believe that there are tendencies based upon the the sins of our, uh, you know, our parents that if we're not careful, we have a propensity to continue to perpetuate those things. They, they, they will fall into us easier than they would for other people. And so, you know, how do we move forward in this? You know, I think it's recognizing where those tendencies may be. Um, you know, I don't need someone to run up and hug me arbitrarily and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and like, that's <laughs> brother. Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. That's, you know, I don't, I don't need that. Um, and you mentioned something a minute ago about white privilege and, you know, I think in terms of white privilege, specifically right now, is that I think the privilege, I think you have the privilege or white people have the privilege of not having difficult conversations with their sons. You know, I think that is part of the privilege there is that there are a lot of things that um, we are having to unearth and talk about that white people in general have the privilege of not not doing that and not having no, having to have those conversations with your you know your son who's just now started driver's ed and having to sit down with him and walk him through you know, if he gets pulled over, um, what he needs to do. Um, and so anyway, I don't know if that fully answered the question, but I, I think these difficult conversations are a path to at least start walking hand in hand together. There are no easy answers to this. And sometimes we have to sit in an uncomfortable silence together. Sometimes we have to you know, sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron and go back and forth. Um, but I think that is part of, you know, the healing process because um, I was telling someone yesterday, I think what has been the blessing out of all of this is that we as, as black people are regaining our voice, mm-hmm. our voices, because we've had to push down so much for so long to go along, to get along mm. and it, and to make other people comfortable. That kind of, it's kind of one of those things where you just assume you're okay because you've been able to push it down for so long. And this situation has brought, um, so much more to light that now we're able to go, yeah, this incident that happened 20 years ago, it did affect me. And, just to be seen and and heard. It's not that we want to either give us a, a solution, um, but just to just to know, hey, I, I I don't understand what you went through, but I I feel you, I see you, and I'm I'm sorry that that happened. Mm. That's good. <laughs> mm. <laughs>